Hi everyone, Kate here, and in this video we'll be discussing what products Victorian women used on their hair. Okay, I think I'm gonna have to take off the hat. There we go, that's better. It's getting a little, little warm with the hat. <laughs> Now, before we begin, a little disclaimer, I'm going to be making a lot of generalizations in this video. The truth of the matter is, there was a tremendous amount of variation in terms of both products and their formulas, just as there is nowadays. Not every product is going to work for every person, and people have their own personal preferences about what they like and what they don't like. This video is not the be-all and end-all of Victorian hair care, but more just a general overview of some of the popular or at least better documented products in the time period. As always, I prefer to use primary rather than secondary sources for my videos. The information I'm presenting today has been gathered from a range of historical beauty books and pharmaceutical manuals dating from about the mid to late Victorian period. I'm going to link down below my most used sources for this video in case you want to check them out for yourself. Well, without any further ado, here's my list of popular Victorian hair care products. Let's start with the most basic and most widely used Victorian hair care product, shampoo. Egg shampoos are perhaps one of the better known ways that Victorians wash their hair. These were quite widely recommended in books, although they varied quite a bit both in terms of their formulation and their application method. In general, an egg, or two, or at least part of an egg, was beaten together, sometimes with water, and then massaged into the hair and or scalp. <laughs> After saturating with the egg goo, the head was then rinsed with clean water. You want to use warm water rather than hot water for this, as hot water will actually cook the egg into your hair. <laughs> Ask me how I know that fun fact. <laughs> I, I have actually done that. <laughs> Cooked egg is a lot harder to rinse out. <laughs> now egg shampoos were hardly the only type of shampoo available. Eggs were actually fairly expensive during the Victorian period, so it seems unlikely that the lower classes would have been able to afford to use them as shampoo, and I'm sure many women just preferred to use other cleansing methods. Many other hair washes consisted of a liquid that was rinsed through the hair. Lemon juice, salt water, and cooled herbal teas, especially those made with rosemary or burdock root, were all used to cleanse the hair in this way. There were also stronger concoctions that contained relatively high amounts of alcohol, I haven't tried any of these mixtures myself, but I feel like they would be fairly effective, as alcohol does make for a great solvent. Other popular hair wash ingredients included borax, sodium carbonate, and ammonia. <laughs> None of which I would recommend trying. Am ammonia was a popular choice. <laughs> the Victorians were, were big fans of ammonia. <laughs> Soap was also used to cleanse the hair occasionally. Usually it was grated and mixed with some of the other ingredients that I've already mentioned. For example, My Lady's Dressing Room from 1892 recommends dissolving small pieces of soap with some sodium carbonate in a mixture of perfume and purified alcohol. Now this sounds quite harsh, but women were washing their hair a lot less frequently back then, so this may have been less of a problem than it would be if you tried to use such a substance nowadays. Nothing like a protective layer of grease. <laughs> For those preferring to wash their hair without water, you could use a powdered product. These products mostly consisted of a perfumed starch that was sprinkled on the hair and then brushed out, much like a modern dry shampoo. These powder shampoos could be used as a replacement for regular shampoo or used in between a water wash to extend the life of it. I suspect the popularity of these products is that indoor plumbing was still not entirely a thing in a lot of households, and there were no hair dryers. It gets a little chilly in the winter. <laughs> the Victorians were pretty big on hair tonics. It seems there's a different product available for virtually any hair and scalp condition you can think of. Baldness or thinning hair was a pretty commonly targeted problem with a plethora of suggestions, ranging from harmless concoctions such as castor oil, sage tea, or onion juice, to downright poisonous mixtures containing high amounts of lead. Victorians also love lead. Most products, however, fell somewhere in the middle. 
They may have been rather irritating to the scalp in order to increase blood flow, but they weren't actually harmful. I doubt many were actually effective either, but <laughs> hope springs eternal. <laughs> this is a point where I wanted to mention some common tonic ingredients, but there was really such a wide range of ingredients being used that we would be here all day. <laughs> Instead, here's a quick look at just a handful of tonic recipes. Another popular hair product was hair oil. Hair oils were used for a variety of purposes. They can be used as a scalp treatment, as a remedy for dry hair, or as a styling product. These oils were often heavily scented and sometimes were also tinted as well, usually in a red color. Victorians used a variety of different base oils, such as almond oil, olive oil, and castor oil, as well as some animal-based greases, such as beef fat and lard which sounds kind of gross to me, but <laughs> you do you, Victorians. <laughs> I'm not going to go into too much detail about hair dye, as it's a subject that really deserves its own video. It's one of those products that Victorian authors warn their readers against at all costs, and then they provide several recipes for anyways. <laughs> Suffice it to say, many of these dyes were either ineffective or very dangerous to use. <laughs> Except henna. Henna is fabulous. There were an array of curling products marketed to women, especially starting in the late Victorian period. I find you can't open a historical magazine without stumbling across an advertisement for one of these products. There were a number of homemade options as well, which were usually intended to be used as a setting lotion. The most common variation I've seen is taking gum arabic and mixing it with water and sometimes a few other ingredients. I made a video a while back on this type of curling fluid, and I can personally testify it actually works quite well at holding a curl. Other common curling fluids included a borax water solution, which was sometimes also mixed with gum arabic, boiled quince seeds, and oil. Many of these preparations also included alcohol, likely for preservation purposes, as well as some sort of perfume. As a side note, a mixture of gum or quince seeds was also often used for what was called a bandolin. It's a very similar product, but it's intended more for hair smoothing and styling rather than for setting curls. More like a modern hair gel than a setting lotion. In addition to gum-based liquids, there were also plenty of oil and wax concoctions. Pomades and pomatums consisted mainly of oils, animal, vegetable, or mineral, and were used by women to style their curls tame their frizz, or otherwise smooth and intricate updo. These often included things like wax or honey to improve the hold, and were usually scented. Victorians really loved a scented hair product. A few other fun hair products I just had to mention included scented hair rinses, hair perfumes, sometimes in an oil form, hair glosses, and sparkly hair powders. I made one of these shimmering hair powders last Christmas, and it was so much fun. <laughs> I will try to remember to link the video in the description below. Well, I feel like I've only briefly scratched the surface on this topic, but we have arrived at the end of the video. I'm starting to lose my voice a bit. <laughs> Let me know down in the comments if there's any product you want me to cover in a bit more depth in a video, or perhaps provide a recipe for. As always, thank you for watching, and I will see you guys next time. Bye! the hat too much. Have I only been filming for 12 minutes? I feel like I've been talking for days. Okay. I'm so tired today. <gasps> uh, why is today filming day? Today should be napping day. Oh, good. This, this light is kind of washing me out a bit. You can't tell I got the, uh,
<laughs> dark, suggestive, uh, blasé look going on today. <laughs> Intentional Victorian style choice, I'm sure. <laughs> I better, do I look a bit like a linebacker in this cape? <laughs> I haven't worn this thing on camera before. It's a, it is an actual historical cape. It's got a, you know, rot, rotting, <laughs> it's still gliding. <laughs> it's a little icky if I'm honest. <laughs> I feel like when I try to smile when I'm in, when I'm reading, I kind of look like I'm in pain. Maybe I should, <laughs> maybe I should be grumpier. <laughs> that be more flattering. <laughs> Pomades and pomades and potum, pomatums, pomades and pomatums, pomades, pomatums, tomatoes, tomatoes. Did I say it? Pomat. Oh, pomatums, pomatum. It must be pomat. I I looked this up ahead of time and Google was not helpful. <sighs> I think I'm slouching. I notice like as the video progresses, I seem to get lower and lower. <laughs> The energy drains out, and I'm just like on the floor by the end of it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Up. Straight. <laughs> we got this. <laughs> on the last page. <sighs> oh, man. If this video doesn't turn out, I'm gonna like cry. <laughs> This video is made possible through the generous support of my Patreon members. Thank you.